This is the Italian Citizenship Podcast, hosted by Marco Permunian and Rafael Di Furia. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Italian Citizenship Podcast, presented by Italian Citizenship Assistance. Dot com where you can find Marco Permunian and his team that can help you through the process of Italian citizenship. Marco is, of course, the head of the U.S. Office of Italian Citizenship Assistance and an Italian attorney. Welcome, Marco. Thank you for coming back to uh, talk some more about Italian citizenship. Thank you, Rafael. So let's get into it. Today, we wanted to talk a little bit more about Jure Sanguinis. We've previously spoken about Jure Sanguinis at the consulate, Jure Sanguinis uh, in Italy, and also going through 1948 cases. We've done those more as an overview, but today we wanted to go through the step-by-step of a recommended procedure of how to go through that process, whether you're doing it alone or with the assistance of Marco and his team. But Marco, what would you say would be the first place that a person has to start out with when they're going through this process? The first step would be determining if you qualify for Italian citizenship by descent. Um, of course, being of Italian descent doesn't automatically qualify you for Italian citizenship by descent. There are certain requirements that need to be met. So having an Italian ancestor who was still alive in 1861 when Italy was unified. That's the first of the eligibility requirements. So you need to have an Italian ancestor who, even if he or she left Italy before Italy became a country, as long as they were still alive in 1861, you can use them as your Italian ancestor. The second requirement would be that the Italian ancestor wasn't naturalized before the birth of their child born in the foreign country and before 1912. So it's it's a double requirement. Uh, the ancestor must have not become naturalized before the birth of the child and before 1912. The third um, requirement that need to be met is if you have a female ancestor in your Italian line, she needs to have given birth to her child after 1948. Because if she gave birth to her child before 1948, you can still get the Italian citizenship through a different process, which we will talk about in a different video, and we have talked about in another video, in another episode. Um, I'm referring to the 1948 cases. But in order for your case to be like a regular case, the, if you have a female ancestor in your Italian line, the child of this female must have been born after January 1st, 1948, which is when the Italian constitution uh, was was created and came into effect. Prior to 1948, uh, there were discriminatory laws against, against women, and therefore like women were not considered as able to transfer their Italian citizenship onto their children. But after 1948, women and men, they because of the Italian constitution, they were considered to have the same rights, including the ability to transfer their Italian citizenship onto their children. So if you meet these requirements, it is very likely that you will qualify for Italian citizenship. There are, of course, more requirements that apply to different to more specific cases so these are not all of the requirements to qualify but of course getting into the details for all the different scenarios it's, it's probably not possible in this video but for the vast majority of cases these qualification rules are the rules that apply to to like the most standard cases so from the sounds of it, that sounds like basically the end of step one right there. What would be the next step in the process going on from there? The next step would be start gathering the necessary documents. If you live, though, within the jurisdiction of a consulate that has a long wait time for an appointment, it could be wise to also go ahead and secure your appointment because it could take months before you're able to actually have the interview with the consulate. So you can use that time to gather the necessary documents. The documents required for the process are basically the documents through which you show that you qualify for Italian citizenship by descent. So mainly you have to procure vital record documents, 
pertaining to all of the individuals in your Italian line, starting from the Italian ancestor down to you. Some consulates require uh, also documents for the non-in-line relatives, so the spouses of the individuals in your Italian line, so also their birth certificates and death certificates, along with the birth, marriage and death certificates for all of the individuals in your Italian line. Uh, the majority of these documents for the people who live in the US are to be collected in the US, uh, with the exception of the Italian records pertaining to your Italian ancestor. So a, a lot of people actually believe that they have to collect a large amount of documents from Italy, but actually you need very few documents from Italy, just the documents pertaining to your Italian ancestors. So the birth certificate of your, say, great-grandfather, great-grandmother, their marriage record if they got married in Italy, but all of the, the other documents would be in the US. A very important document that you also have to collect is the naturalization um, records for your Italian-born ancestor because that will determine if you qualify for Italian citizenships. And of course, when the ancestor never became naturalized, you have to collect other documents proving that the ancestor never became naturalized. But we went we went over this in another video in detail. Once you have collected all of the required documents, you have to legalize them. If we are referring to US documents, the legalization is done through an apostille, which is issued in the US, normally by the Secretary of State's office. And the final step would be translating your documents into Italian. If though your documents present discrepancies and inconsistencies, you should potentially have to look into amending your documents to make them um, consistent. Because one thing that the consulates don't like is too many discrepancies on the documents. But anyway, this would be like step two, gathering and putting together all of the necessary documents. And I don't know if you have any suggestions for um, the people that are watching us when you went through the process. Actually, for me, when I went through the process, I had a little bit of a complicated situation just because there was some name changes and some divorces that were in my family line. Uh, at the time, and even today, like when you're looking at the information on the consulate's websites, they even though they list what you need, they don't necessarily list everything you need. They give you a rough idea, but sometimes you will need a name change document or um, or a divorce because that will end up helping to prove one other document to kind of show the next step in your family line because there has to be you have to be able to tell the full story and there can't be any gaps in that storyline, so to speak. Uh, and sometimes, for example, if there was a name change of a woman, um, for example, she was married to her first husband and then got divorced, but then she got married to her second husband and she had her, her um, first married name and then she went straight to the second married name and then she just ended up... Uh, which was possible at the time, and I, I believe it still is possible, just going to, to the DMV and just getting a new ID with her, with, her, her, with her maiden name without actually going to the court and getting the, the decree from there, that could potentially cause a problem with trying to prove who that individual is because as far as they know, the first person, even though the person has their same name that they had when they were born, from the government's perspective, that could end up technically being two people that they don't know who is who because they have, they can see the person with name A, the name with B and C, but they can't how, see how person C went back to being person A. So that's something that just in uh, could be one potential 
um, situation for somebody. Um, and also to what ended up happening for me was that there were certain details about my own family that I didn't really know until finding this out through documentation. Because even when I was starting to look through it, I was seeing, okay, something didn't match up here or something didn't match up there. What's going on? Um, and to find out about family members that we didn't even know existed were, um, were, were people were actually in existence. The poor way of saying that. Um, so that's one thing where having, I know like, because I did things DIY, having some, a service like what you offer can make a huge difference because you know what to look for. You're already used to many different types of scenarios, both simple and complicated and know what the Italian consulate would be looking for. Whereas somebody like myself, when I was starting to go through it, I was like, okay, well, this is the document that's being asked for, but is it the document that's needed? And there's a, there can be a difference between them. But also the thing that was much more complicated in the terminology that's important for Italian citizenship at some point, uh, because there are various terms like uh, sealed documents or apostille, certified copy, uh, original, this, that, and the other that can be quite confusing the first time that you go into this because, well, if this is the certified document, then why do I need a certification for the certification? But that was also one thing that I found confusing, like you were talking about getting um, the, the apostilles and so on for the documents uh, and understanding that different types of documents need to get their certifications from different offices that you can't just send it to one central office, especially if you're in the United States. Um, that was something that I found a uh, personally a little bit confusing at the time. Of course, now hindsight is twenty twenty, and everything makes sense. Um, but anyway, moving on to step number three in the process, where would a person go from there once uh, they've found out that they are in fact eligible and that they've um, gone through their documents? Um, what would be the next thing for them to do? The next step would be preparing your application package to be presented to the consulate. So you should probably organize all of your documents in a binder, which not only should include the documents that we talked about so far, but also the application forms that you have to present the day of your appointment. So there are several application forms that you have to present to um, to apply for citizenship. Uh, normally, what's required, at least in the US, is Form 1, where you include all of your personal information and your Italian ancestors information. Form 2, which is a form in which you declare that you never renounced your right to Italian citizenship. And then we have Form 3, which needs to be signed and notarized by your living Italian ascendants. So, for example, if you have a living parent or grandparent in your Italian line, they have to sign this document and get it notarized unless they come with you to the interview. In that case, it is not necessary to get it notarized. They can sign it at the consulate. And the last form required is Form 4, which is the form where you declare that your deceased ancestor ancestors never renounce their right to Italian citizenship. There may be other forms required by some of the consulates because they the consulates have slightly different requirements sometimes and, and forms required. Once you have uh, put together all of these documents along with the uh, proof of payment, the, the 300 euros payments, payment that is required to apply for citizenship, you can go ahead and submit your application at the Italian consulate and attend your interview. Now, before the current health crisis, uh, people had to attend in-person interviews. There are some consulates that are still allowing people to attend in-person interviews, but most consulates, they ask you to mail in the application package. Um, so instead of attending an in-person appointment, you just mail in the package, which will be evaluated by the consulate. And I believe at this point we can maybe talk about what happens uh, during the interview with the consulate uh, during the appointment. Because a lot of people ask me, like, should I be concerned about the interview? What's going to happen? Do I have to speak Italian? Uh, what questions will I be asked? And maybe you can also share your experience. Uh, during the interview, the consulate will basically review your documents and 
uh, see if you have all of the required documents to prove that you are entitled to Italian citizenship. So as I say to my clients, it's not a test. You're not applying for naturalization, so you don't have to speak Italian. You don't have to know uh, anything about Italy or the Italian culture or language. You are applying for a retroactive recognition of your uh, Italian citizenship, which you actually had since birth. So that's why the appointment with the consulate is basically just to review the documents that you have collected and to see if they show that you are entitled to Italian citizenship. So the consulate will focus on the documents that you present, uh, the birth certificates, the death certificates, the naturalization records, which have to prove that you are entitled to Italian citizenship. Now, one of the issues that, that there could be is related to the discrepancies. So if you didn't amend all of your documents, the consulate could ask you to integrate the application at a later time and maybe amend some of the necessary documents. They normally give you very detailed instructions the day of your appointment, so they tell you what exactly they want you to correct and amend in your documents. And the same goes, of course, for missing documents. Like if you're missing some of the required documents, they will ask you to provide those documents. And in most cases, it's not necessary to secure another appointment with the consulate because you can provide, if your application was close to be to being 100% complete, so if it was like 80% complete or 90% complete, they will normally allow you to provide the, the additional documents through the mail. So without having to go to another appointment, without having to secure another appointment and potentially wait a very long time for a new appointment. There are some consulates that will ask you to secure another appointment, but normally those are the consulates where the appointments are available like... Where it's much easier to acquire an appointment. Than exactly, like the Houston consulate, for example, sometimes requires people to secure another appointment because the wait time for an appointment is very short, just a couple of months. No, I mean, I think in that kind of case also, I think it is preferred sometimes just because it's easier if you're sitting there with them that if they have any questions that you don't have to have the back and forth. It's actually better for you in the end, even though you have to take out the time to go there in person and have the appointment. Um, sometimes it could really just be as simple as just dropping the papers off, but sometimes it could be as involved as needing to explain something that they see on the documents because maybe they see something that is on the new document that raises a new question for them. It's not common that that would happen. Um, usually when you get homework and you're sent to go take care of a few tasks. They don't really ask for more than what they ask for on the day of your appointment. Um, but kind of just going back to what you were talking about before, that while it may not be required to have uh, a language exam or a cultural exam, that it can be nice to go in with a little bit of basic Italian, but formal Italian. You don't want to walk in saying, ciao, come stai? You would more say, buongiorno. Because also for us Americans, especially for us to say, hi, how are you? That's just something that you say to everybody and you don't... I don't know, I guess you care, but you don't really care. It's just kind of the how are you part is a thrown in as like an extension of the hello. Whereas if you're actually in Italy or speaking in Italian, and a lot of other languages work like this, that if you ask how somebody is, it's a very serious question about like you actually are concerned and wanting to know what's going on with them. And especially if you're saying come stai, that's very informal. Um, but also at the same time, uh, like I've mentioned in previous episodes, is that I'm also of the opinion that if you don't speak Italian, don't use too much because then you might get stuck in a uh, conversation where it'll be above your head. But of course, if you're in a country where, like the United States, where it's required for them to speak English, and if English is your mother tongue, then it is definitely worthwhile conducting the, the interview in English um, because you'll have the possibility to do so and be able to explain in your language in a way that's comfortable for you rather than have to reach for words in a second language, even if you are somewhat comfortable in Italian it can be worthwhile so that there's no misunderstandings, so that if you make a slight mistake on the conjugation of a verb, that they might understand one thing versus another thing. I think it's more worthwhile personally to do that. And of course, um, there will be times when they say about like, oh, you should learn Italian, you should learn this, you should learn that. But that'll of course be up to the individual um, 
uh, representative that you speak to. But in regards to potential amendments and things that may come about that you were mentioning, what would be, if that had to come up, are those things that are difficult to take care of? And is that something that you help your clients with? It happens quite rarely that our clients are, are asked to integrate their applications because of our experience. We know what the consulates want. We know how flexible that specific consulate can be. But in the unlikely case that uh, the consulate has any remarks, uh, maybe they don't like a minor discrepancy, uh, like a, a very little detail which was left there on purpose, we keep working on our clients' case, cases at no additional cost. We integrate the applications until the consulate is satisfied. So we take care also, of course, of the uh, this like phase of the process after the appointment, if there is like more work to do, we keep working on our clients' cases. But like I said, it happens very rarely with our clients. But if you're going through the process, uh, DIY, the, re the integration requested by the consulate could be as easy as a very easy amendment to a document or as difficult as a legal name change. Maybe it's necessary to go through, through a court order to get a document amended. So it really depends on, on the specific case. But then moving on from this part of the process and say that someone has um, moved forward from their appointment and if they had any amendment, uh, sorry, anything to integrate into their, um, into their application, anything to add any homework, uh, and has taken care of all of that part of this process, what would be the next step from there? So if the application was in order when you presented it, or when you submit the additional documents requested by the consulate, from that moment, you need to start basically waiting for a decision from the consulate, which can take several months, depending on the workload of the consulate. So. A lot of people ask me if they are granted citizenship on the spot, like when they attend the interview. If everything is in order, do I get citizenship right away? Do I walk out with a passport? Unfortunately, in all cases, so if the application is in order, but also if there is like an integration that is requested, it never happens that they give you citizenship right away. The consulate has a sometimes long processing time, which can take like a few months. And normally you hear from the consulate via email, um, which is also like very hard to believe for some people that they don't even get a phone call. But normally they, the consulate emails you with information about your, your case. And, and in most cases, it's just an email saying you were granted Italian citizenship. So you're now an Italian citizen and, and you can request an Italian passport. Now, this way of, of proceeding is though justified by the fact that you are not really applying, as we said, for naturalization. So you were an Italian citizen prior to starting this process, but you were just you're just going through the through a process to have like an official confirmation that you hold Italian citizenship. So that's why it is as simple as getting an email for you to be granted Italian citizenship. Actually something interesting about that is that I know um, while in the U.S. most people do receive an email that they that they say you're you've been granted Italian citizenship or Italian citizenship has been recognized, I know that there actually are some people that never receive an email from the consulate, but they receive an email from the comune of their Italian ancestor um, that says they have been registered. And this would this email would be in Italian, um, or not even an email, but just a, a PDF or a JPEG attached to an email with the registration and the IDA, and they're wondering. Am I a citizen? Am I not a citizen? What's the situation in that case? Like, what's what am I going through? What am I if I've been registered in the IDA? And then they find out actually that that registration means that they have been in fact recognized. Um, so there could be that that off chance. It's not common, but it's not unheard of as well. That is definitely a good point. Sometimes people don't even hear from the consulate, maybe because the consulate had like your email spelled wrong and but but luckily like you hear from from the comune directly which is like a subsequent step like uh, first you should hear from the consulate and then you should hear from the comune but like some people as you just said hear directly from the italian municipality um, but uh, during the processing time of course if you have if you're wondering um, 
whether you've been recognized or, or even if you're not, it could be a good idea to follow up like from time to time because like to, to avoid this situation where you don't even get an email. So uh, consulates can be quite unresponsive, but normally if you follow up a few times, you will get a response. Of course, it's, it's good not to bother them right, too much, of course, because, definitely. Like, not to put pressure on them. Uh, because you know they are the ones processing your application, so uh, it's easy for them like to put your application aside and work on some. I, unfortunately, else. that really is too easy, and I have seen that happen before. Sadly, it's it's very strange that that could even be a possible thing coming from an American perspective. Um, but at the end of the day, humans are human, and we just it's of course best to be respectful to everybody. It, to me, it was actually something that I found very fascinating that someone who would be in what you might think of as a lower clerical position um, or just even a position that would be maybe what you might think of as um, an assistant position can have a lot of way, uh, a lot of say on your process and the outcome of your process and the time for your process. Um, but if the unfortunate thing is that going through this process that can be that I found very frustrating and I know a lot of people also find um, somewhat frustrating is that you don't get regular updates. This is what happened. This is what happened. There's no status bar that you can go to online um, where you can find out where in the process and where in the processing um, your 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 application currently stands like some sort of percentage bar or something like or, or to find out like the updates of like that they enter x document into the system and that they make a note of it that's not it's not publicly available it's not privately available it's very odd i mean or even uh sometimes um the documents can end up sitting on someone's desk for a short period of time while they're processing other documents or and even sometimes i've seen um, and I've spoken to people where it's been one family that they've applied at multiple different consulates, but it of course all goes through the, through the same um, comune here in Italy. On occasion, if the comune or the, the person at the comune sees a couple of different people with the same last name, they'll try to process them all either together or very close to each other because it all goes back to the same family file and while they have it open, it just makes it easier if they can do it at the same time. So I, I know someone in particular off the top of my head that they applied in, I think, the DC consulate, but then their sibling did it in the Boston consulate, but they did it like a couple of months apart from each other and they ended up getting their recognition at the same time from the comune because the comune ended up seeing that same family let's just do it all together at the same time but anyway so once a person has been very patient which can be one of the most difficult situations to hurry up and wait um what would be the next step from there once they actually get their confirmation whether it's by email saying hey you're a citizen or the registration in the ida um what what steps would they want to take from there once you have received the email from the consulate um, which normally also indicates that you have been registered with the IDA if or sometimes you hear separately from the comune sometimes like the same email also indicates that you have been registered uh, with the IDA but anyway when you get that email you can go ahead and apply for an Italian passport just for clarity you can apply for an Italian passport only if you are registered with the IDA because being registered with the IDA is what allows you to access the consul the consular services so make sure you're registered with the IDE, and then you can go ahead and apply for an Italian passport, even if, like we said, the registration with the IDE happens automatically, normally. But anyway, the passport application involves an in-person appointment again, so you have to travel to the consulate again. You have to secure an appointment first, and the wait time for an appointment is normally a few weeks in most cases. The way that you have to secure an appointment is through normally an online booking system made available by your local Italian consulate. So you go online, you should already have your account because it's the same account that you used when you book your when you booked your citizenship appointment. So you use the same account to now book a passport appointment. You show up at your appointment with a few more forms that you have to fill out. You have to bring a photo, uh, the payment for the passport 
and the passport in some cases is given to you the same day so you go back home with your Italian passport some other times it's going to be mailed to you after about like one or two weeks this is something that we maybe should clarify for uh, the people that have asked me this question in the past like does my citizenship expire um, what happens if I don't do anything for the future like what happens to my Italian citizenship your Italian citizenship doesn't expire what expires is your Italian passport which normally expires after 10 years so after 10 years you may have to renew your Italian passport but even if you don't renew your Italian passport you just leave it there and you leave it like it expires your citizenship will never expire so you can potentially apply for a new passport even like in after 20 years And one point I think to add just to what you said quickly is that once you've already been recognized and you do have that registration in the IRE is that if there's a vote that's coming up in Italy, for example, at the time of recording this, we are just getting up to the point before the referendum um, and already the people who have already been recognized as Italian citizens would have already received um, or should have in theory received their, um, their voting ballots from their comuni in Italy. But uh, in the case where a vote will come up in the future and you are living abroad, uh, the registration with the IDA is what also will allow you to make your voice heard in Italy. And if there's ever any emergencies like you've spoken about in the past episodes, like if there's ever a situation where you feel like you need to get back to Italy, um, that can end up making a bit of a difference uh, if you are, in fact, registered with the Italian consulate for where you are. But anyway, of course, we've covered a lot of ground again in this episode. We will be doing another future episode very similar to this one. Even though we have spoken about these processes before, we wanted to make sure to cover them in more depth, going through the exact steps of them. And even though there's a lot of crossover between applying at a consulate versus applying in Italy, we wanted to, in this video, focus on applying at an Italian consulate, whereas in the future, we'll do a separate video specifically on the process of applying in Italy because, again, like I was saying, while they are similar, there are some differences that could make it slightly confusing that if you're trying to listen for one subject or if you're trying to listen for the other subject, that could be uh, if you're just getting used to some of the this process and the terminology around it. Um, Again, just to make it less confusing, rather than repeat myself more, I will say thank you for joining us again. Thank you, of course, to Marco for making yourself available to talk more about the Italian citizenship process. And of course, if you are interested in assistance with this process, Marco and his team at ItalianCitizenshipAssistance.com are available to help you through the process to answer questions and to help you get down that path of Italian citizenship and reach your goal. And if you would like to see more content about moving to Italy, life in Italy, living in Italy as an expat and living in Italy as a dual citizen, I also have my own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Rafael Di Furia. And we also do other videos on the same YouTube channel about purchasing property here in Italy, uh, where Marco also talks about that um, with his affiliation with Italian real estate lawyers com in the Italian real estate podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again, and we will see you all next time. Later. Thank you.